up there. Good morning, Waypoint. Good to have everyone here this morning. I want to welcome you to worship. We've got a few announcements uh, as we come to the, to the community gathering together. Uh, first of all, I want to let you know the partnership class is going to kick off on the 31st. And Wes will talk about this a little bit in, in a little bit, uh, but on the 31st of October, next Sunday, and then on the two following Sundays in November. And again, if you are new to Waypoint and interested in, in thinking and hearing more about uh, what really makes us tick as a community, then we'd love for you to come to that. And I would also tell you, if you've been to that class, oh, I've already done that, uh, we've changed a fair amount about it and how we do it. And it's a fun, I think you'd find it a really uh, great time, even if you've been coming to Waypoint for a while. So I want to just invite you to the partnership classes. And again, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So uh, that's, our, that's our main announcement this morning. We've got uh, a lot of small group opportunities, as we've mentioned before. And if you're interested in getting involved in a community group, uh, would love to talk to you about that. Feel free to just reach out to me or Wes or any of us uh, after the service. We'd love to have you join us for any of those uh, that are coming up uh, toward the holidays. Last thing I'll mention, and we're still coming up with a date for this, but we are talking about having a worship night where we're just going to gather as a community. Uh, be out. It won't be in the chapel. We're, we're talking about the venue and where to have it, but I just want to let you all know that uh, between now and December, the hope is that we would have uh, a worship night where we just kind of come and gather uh, as a community and, and have more of a uh, just a low-key experience uh, on a weeknight, probably a Wednesday night. And the plan would be that if that goes well, we'll probably do one uh, in the winter uh, and after the turn of the year and then also another one in the spring. So just want to let you know that. So one uh, last thing. Yes, Wes, you got a question? Yeah, a question. Oh, hi, I'm Mike. The women's social. Um, so the women's social is, what is the Day. Uh, we don't know. That's why I it's know. a women's social. It's a women's social, yeah. Here we Thursday. go, Jessica. Thank you, Thursday. Uh, the women's social, if you're interested in that, uh, you should see it on the Wednesday email. We'd love for you to come join if you're uh, interested in coming to that. That'd be a great time just to get together with some of the, the ladies at Waypoint and uh, get to know them and uh, just a great chance to come and, and have some fellowship with them. So, anything else I'm missing? All right, last thing I want to say, I just want to welcome. This is a real treat for me to uh, kind of put the guitar on the stand for the next few weeks, honestly. Danny O'Dell is here with us this morning. He's from Lake Forest Church. Uh, he's worked with Aaron Maynard, who many of you know from the Women's Retreat and also being with us. But I just want to welcome Danny. His fiance, Sammy, is with us as well, and her friend Jill. And I just want to welcome you guys, and thank you very much for being here this morning. Uh, and I'm really uh, just thrilled to have Danny here. So let me just pray for us, and we'll get started. Father, thank you for this time. We ask as we come and just turn our hearts to worship that you would uh, reframe the things in our mind and our hearts that have kept us away from you this, uh, this day and this week. We thank you for the chance to come into this place and to bring all that we are 
and just to put it before you and just come in song and come in your word and uh, listen to what you have to say to us today. So we thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you standing in worship with me? stripped away and I simply call longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for song in itself it's not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. King of endless world, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself It's not what you have required Thank you, God You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart And I'm coming back to heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I made it and it's all about you it's all about you I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you, God It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus all about you God all about you I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I made it's all about you. It's all about you, yeah. And it's all about you, God. It's all about you, yeah. And it's all about you. 
It's all about you, Jesus. Oh, my God. We come to worship you today. Everything I have. Desire God. Lord, as we worship you this morning, I just pray that whatever we have that's distracting us from your presence, God, and your love, that we just put it aside for the next hour. God, let us just focus on you and your love for us. Lord, you have us here for a reason. Open our hearts to that. Let us be still in, in your heart.
together and we'll sing beautiful pray with me. God, you're so beautiful, and we love you so much. Everything that you are, without without your love, without your presence, God, why would we even be here, God? And as we go into this next song, Lord, can we just really just open our hearts and just come to the moment where we were lost? And in Luke 15, it says that, the the shepherd will leave his 99 to find the one. And when he does, all of heaven will rejoice. Uh, Before I spoke a word and you were singing over me And you have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath and you breathed your life in me And you have been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah, yeah. When I was your foe, still you love far from me. And you have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth and you paid it all for me, yes you did. And you have been so, so kind to me. And oh, in 
and all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. just going to take a few minutes. I was thinking about what to do for the confession this morning, and as I was going through scriptures for the songs, Psalm 51 just kept coming up in my heart and my mind. So I'm going to read uh, 17 verses, the first 17 verses of Psalm 51. I invite you to listen, just kind of close your eyes, be with the Lord, then give you 30 seconds after that just to be with the Lord yourself and to just see what he's saying to your heart and your mind. And uh, so let's just hear the word of God and turn our hearts to him as Danny plays. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, and surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. 
Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners to turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. So, Father, we just come to you right now. Turn our hearts to you in silence. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, it leaves a nine and nine. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Lord, we thank you that you, in your forgiveness, as we come in confession, Lord, you wash us whiter than snow, and our sins are removed from you as far as the east is from the west, according to Scripture. So, Lord, renew us. Keep the enemy from bringing things back into our heart and mind that you have already forgiven. And we thank you for the grace and the mercy that you've given us through Christ. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. Danny, thank you for that gift of leading us as, um, quite honestly, the refrain or uh, we were singing of reckless love. I was once asked a compelling question by a church planner was, uh, what do you want a first-time visitor of Waypoint to be like five years from now? And and I was, as we were singing that song, as I was standing in the back just singing that with y'all and over y'all, I realized those are the things that I long for you to know. That if you leave here today with only taking away one thing, may it be the lines of these that you sang. That though you couldn't earn it, though you don't deserve it, may you know that overwhelming love of God. Whether it's the first time you've been here or five years into this, or wherever you are in your spiritual journey, could those promises be sung over you and in your heart today. Know that God loves you, and his love is reckless and overwhelming And so at Waypoint, our our goal, our mission, we say, is we want to draw people one step closer to this love of Jesus Christ. And then we want to compel them, challenge them to go one step further out into mission and service in his name. And so today, I'm going to kind of focus probably on that second half of the message uh, a little bit more of challenging us to go. But it only happens when we know that overwhelming love of God in our hearts. And so I would invite you, if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to be jumping through a couple different verses, but we'll be looking at Ephesians and the book of Acts, and just invite you to open it up. But let me just pray for us real quick. Heavenly Father, I ask that your spirit would continue to move and to speak clearly to each one of us, that you would set me aside so you could be glorified, that whatever you want to speak to each of our hearts, you would give us ears to hear that word, and you'd give us eyes to see you at work in our lives and hearts that we might feel your ever-present presence with us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would transform us 
in this moment. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. So if you've been with us at Waypoint this fall, we've kind of gone back to the basics of Waypoint. We spent the first few weeks of the fall talking about kind of our core beliefs, what it is we believe. And then we're turning and into this new series about how God wants to use us and equip us and send us. And so I want to invite, again, as Chip was sharing at the beginning, that if you're visiting Waypoint, checking it out, if you've considered making Waypoint your kind of spiritual family, your spiritual home, or, or maybe you've already partnered with us in the past, I want to invite you all to our partnership classes. Really, the goal and the objective of these classes is it's not a boring uh, members class, but it's rather a spiritual workshop to equip you with the gospel. And so it's going to be over the next three weeks, starting next Sunday after worship, we're going to talk about what it is you believe and help you kind of come to those core beliefs. And then the next week, Chip's going to lead us through what is your spiritual story and to help you be able to share that with your friends, to just share what God is up to. And then finally, we'll do uh, the third week will be about uh, how God wants to use you and equip you. And so we'd love, again, if you need a refresher course on this or if you want to kind of hear the core DNA of Waypoint, we'd love for you to join us. We'll have lunch provided. There will be child care available as well. And so as we do that, one of the core aspects we use at Waypoint is this verse from Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And in this passage, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus, and he tells them, that Christ gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be shepherds, and some to be teachers. For Waypoint, this is kind of our core leadership idea, that the Spirit equips each one of us to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And I really love it because on the surface, probably a lot of those words scare you all to death. Because we hear the word apostle, we hear the word prophet, we hear the word evangelist, and we start thinking of kind of those street corner people out with signs. And we fail to see what is God trying to use in those languages. And so we're going to spend the next five weeks kind of walking through each of these gifts, each of these functions, and showing how God wants to use you in different ways. To use you as an apostle. An apostle, very simply, is someone who has a vision for where the gospel should go, a, a vision of forward movement. They're asking, where, where are we going? They're forward looking. And a prophet, a prophet's always asking, is this true? They're kind of the guardrails that are helping keep this in line, the mission in line with God's word. And the evangelist, the goal of the evangelist is always trying to connect people to the mission, inviting people in. And the shepherd, the shepherd is always trying to care and nurture for the people in the mission, in the community that way. And the teacher, the teacher is the one who sits at the end of the sermon and says, okay, so what? Well, what do I need to do with this? And is trying to make the big idea really practical. And so we're going to walk through each of these different functions, each of these different gifts, and look in the Bible how God had used men and used women in these functions to move the church forward. And so today we're going to tackle the word apostle. What does it mean to be an apostle? Maybe when you hear that word, you think of that uh, old movie of the apostle, the kind of preacher who, fire and brimstone sort of preacher. But the word apostle very simply means sent one. It's somebody sent with a mission, with a vision, something on their heart. They, they have a, a desire to see forward movement. Apostle is the Greek word apostolos, but you might be more familiar with the Latin word that comes, this comes from. It's missionary, mission. An apostle's one with a mission, with a vision of going forward. In fact, it's where we also get that word missile from. It's someone with a forward movement, forward mission to it. Do you all know the difference between a bomb and a rocket and a missile? A a bomb just has explosive power, just gets dropped into place. While, while a rocket, a rocket has the explosive power and it also has forward propulsion, movement forward. But a missile, a missile has three things to it. It has power and it has forward movement, but it also has a guiding mechanism, a targeting aspect to it. And, and so with that sort of imagery of a missionary, of an apostle, it is someone who's bringing the power of God to places 
There, there's forward movement, but there's also intentionality and, and guiding nature of God and what, how and where he wants to use us. And so in part of the partnership class, we'll use a kind of assessment tool a gentleman, Alan Hirsch, has put together. And I, back when Waypoint was getting started, I figured I needed to kind of validate how accurate this sort of test was. And so Dave Redding was kind of my uh, test case. I made him go through the assessment. I don't know if I ever told you this, but I made you go through the assessment because I realized if he scored out with some of the shepherding side of things, the nurture and care, if you know Dave Redding, then you know this assessment wouldn't be right. That, that Dave Redding is an apostle, if you know him. He's always a man looking for new opportunity, ways we can move things forward. And so a mission, a church, a movement needs that sort of apostolic gift to move the mission forward. And today we're going to look at a biblical apostle, a man of that. His name is Paul. Paul, if you know Paul, he's one of the writers of the New Testament. In fact, he writes about two-thirds of the New Testament. And he's a man who's been radically changed by God, radically transformed by God. You see, Paul, earlier in his early life, was known as a man named Saul. And he was a lawyer. He was a respected leader in the Jewish faith. And in fact, he called himself a Pharisee of Pharisees that he was kind of the top dog, the number one man. And Saul's theology, Saul's whole world vision was that you earned, whatever you did, you earned. You earned God's love through following the law. That that he was always about being kind of building, if you make it, if you make it, it's based on your own efforts. And and so when he started to hear word of this kind of Christian movement, they started talking about grace. It was really upsetting to him because his whole philosophy was that you had to follow God's rules to get, uh, make God happy. You had to do all the right things. You needed to take personal responsibility. And so his whole movement early in his life as Saul was kind of built on that. And quite frankly, if you look around our community, our town, and this part of South Charlotte, we carry forward a lot of that same sort of attitude of personal responsibility. That as long as you're following all the rules and living life right, then you're going to just, things are going to go well and your house will get bigger and your paycheck will get bigger and things will get better and better and better. But when Jesus showed up and started to introduce this idea to grace, it radically changes everything. And for Paul, I love how John Calvin describes it, it changes Paul from a cruel wolf He was so kind of bothered by the Christian movement at first that he would go around persecuting Christians because he felt threatened by grace. A question for y'all is, do y'all feel threatened by grace? Because it should throw the whole world, your whole worldview upside down. Remember here at Waypoint, we like to say grace is getting what you don't deserve. As we sang, you didn't earn it, you don't deserve it, yet you have been graced with the presence of God. God loves you. God loves you, not because of anything you've done, but simply because you belong to him. And Paul, Paul one day was walking on a road in Damascus, getting ready to go take a letter to be able to persecute more Christians, when all of a sudden he was blinded out of nowhere. And for three days he was blind and dependent on other people. He was a broken man. And from that began this huge transition from being a cruel wolf to a shepherd. He became and became a man with a mission, a man with a vision, a heart to see the brokenness filled with grace. And so in a fee, uh, excuse me, in 1 Timothy 1.15, he writes to a young man in his life, and he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Right there, he's capturing your attention. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The whole mission of Jesus was to come into the world to save sinners. And then Paul says this, of whom I am the worst. You see, Paul's mission, Paul's vision, Paul's apostolic movement, the missile was launched because he realized as much as he tried to earn God's love, he never could because he was the worst of sinners. 
He knew the brokenness in his heart and the brokenness in his life and his need for that grace. And so he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience for those who might believe that God was willing to show an unlimited patience with Paul. He's willing to show an unlimited patience with me, the worst of all sinners, with each one of us, so that the rest of the world could see this grace, to see this hope. You see, for Paul, this compelled him to leave behind his old life and to go out in a mission, to go out as an apostle, as a missile, to take forth the good news of the gospel. He knew the brokenness in his heart, and so he longed to bring that to the ends of the world, or to the ends of the earth. And so my question for you, I ask this of church planners, I ask this of pastors, I ask this of all of us, is who breaks your heart? Who breaks your heart? Paul's heart was broken for those people who were trying to kind of take personal responsibility and follow all the rules and was wanting to bring them the hope of the gospel. For you, for you, who breaks your heart? How might you carry the good news of the gospel into those broken places? In our cities, in your home, in your family? Where does your heart break? And how might God want to use you? I love this quote of Frederick Beekner's. That vocation, this mission, is a place where the world's greatest need and a person's greatest joy meet. It's where these two things collide. Years ago, I was a pastor at a big steepled church, and I was trying to wrestle with what, what was my vocation, what was my calling, where was my mission to be? And I was longing for something to kind of just give my life to, a purpose greater than myself. And my mother, my mother had done mission trips to Haiti for 20, 25 years. And so the church was putting together a mission trip to Haiti. And I volunteered as a pastor to go with them because I was hoping that maybe being down there in Haiti, God would just kind of capture my heart and give me a heart for the Haitian people just like he had my mother. And I remember flying down there and driving on the bus up through and just seeing the abject poverty in that community. But it never, never fully grabbed my heart. Even though being with the children who are just hungry and in need uh, of help, it never truly grabbed my heart. What I found was I was more compelled with sitting with the people of South Charlotte who were down there wrestling with this. And I realized God had given me a heart not for the Haitian people, but for the South Parkians and the Ballantonians. <laughs> yeah, for you guys. To bring the gospel here to equip you guys so that you guys can go wherever it is the Lord has placed you to bring hope and healing. That whatever the mission God's laid on your heart, you might be freed up, feel empowered, sent like a missile like that. I was working and discipling a young woman one day who, who was really capturing this really well, and she sent me a picture that she had taken in the bathroom at the epicenter in Whiskey River at 2 a.m., there was graffiti on the wall in the women's bathroom in there. And the picture, the graffiti said, I am so lonely, was one line. I need help, was another. And then in big letters it said, this place is hell. And right there I realized that at 2 a.m. in the women's restroom at Whiskey River is the one place that your pastor should never go. And that just puts you on the front page of the observer. But, but that she was uniquely placed to bring that hope into that space. To whoever that person was that was hurting, she could bring that good news of the gospel, that grace to them. You see, that, that's the mission of Waypoint. Where, where can you bring hope? Where can you bring healing? Where, who breaks your heart that they need a little bit of good news? Maybe, maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your children that you just want to equip them with the gospel. Maybe it's your place of business. Maybe it's your school. Where can you bring the good news of the gospel? I, I love the story, and I've told it before, of Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels was the pastor of Willow Creek, a big mega church. 
and he tells the story of standing up one Sunday and uh, kind of lecturing his church and saying, okay, gang, we need third grade Sunday school teachers for the boys. And then Tuesday morning, he says he was in his office, and all of a sudden, this older, just grumpy old man kind of walked into his office, and he said, I'm, I'm here about the Sunday school class teacher. And Bill's like, okay, good, good. We've needed a volunteer. I'm, I'm glad. So, so uh, do you enjoy teaching Sunday school? Oh, I don't know. I've never done it before, the grumpy old man kind of replied. And Bill Hybels then says, well, he then looks at him and goes, well, do you enjoy mentoring young boys, young children? He goes, oh, no, I, I hate kids. <laughs> and so Bill is like, well, then what are you doing in my office? And, and he said, I, I, I'm here because you said you needed a Sunday school teacher. And Bill Hybels very smartly changed the conversation in that moment. And he said, okay, forget that. But, but what, what do you enjoy doing? What do you enjoy doing? And he said, the grumpy old man's kind of face lit up a little bit. And he goes, I, I love fixing cars. And Bill Heibel said, well, you know, I, I realize we've got uh, some young single moms in this church whose cars are breaking down, and we've got an old building in the back. Well, what if we just open up that old building that on Thursday nights you come over and just help start fixing these cars? And, and from there, if you know Willow Creek's history, they began a, a great ministry of automotive repair out of that, out of that man's broken uh, willingness to bring together his greatest joy with a need in the community. So that's a mission of Waypoint. That's our strategy. I, I tell folks, the reasons we've got mission to Peru and, and Chimbote doesn't have, have anything to do with us having some strategic plan or anything. It's because Keith Gershio, 15, 20 years ago, went down there and was radically transformed by the people in Chimbote. And then at one of the launch team meetings, he invited Robbie Bowers to come with him to come check it out. From there grew, I think, eight men went, and then 29 men th went the next year, and we've sent our children down there. And, and it just has grown because Keith Gershio has a heart for the people of Chimbote. If you've ever been down there, you know why they call him the mayor of Chimbote. So the reason we've got a Sunday morning Bible study class is, is because of the Weathersby's. Sandy and Betsy Weathersby years ago came to me when we were over at Myers Park High School and said, we've got this class that has been meeting together for years. Could we just have a room to meet together for church, to, for this Bible study? And it grew because of their mission and their hearts. The reason we did a men's retreat last fall wasn't because any of us thought it was a good idea to do a men's retreat during COVID, but it's because Kevin Young came up to me and said, hey, could we get the men together in this time? This is how Waypoint works. Y'all make fun of me for this, that when y'all come to me and say, hey, you know what the church should do? And I turn around and say, okay, what do you need to make it happen? But, but that's because I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to equip you and to send you as a missile to bring this good news to the world around us. But I'd warn you to be careful about your plans. I was talking with a pastor this past week who hit his church. He was, had a heart to get involved with a ministry called Congregation for Kids. It's a fostering ministry in our town. And so he goes to a presentation and that thing, and this would be a great thing for his uh, church to get involved with and all the members to kind of partner with. But he said when he was sitting in there, all of a sudden God just really started to stir in his heart. And his plan to kind of trick you guys to foster kids, suddenly God changed his heart, and now he's fostering a teenager while he's got four kids of his own and they're fostering their second family here in Charlotte. That though you might have your plans, God is ultimately going to get his plan done through you. That's what Paul learned. Paul had this desire, Acts 16, Paul has this desire to take the gospel into the broken areas of the world. In fact, he had such a clear vision. He saw that if he could just take it from Antioch and into Ephesus, then it would be a quick jump over to Athens and then to Rome. And he saw this plan he had to go in this one direction going that way. But Acts 16 tells us a different story. Acts 16 says that Paul came to Derby, and then to Lystra and a disciple named Timothy lived there. And so Paul took Timothy and his companions and they traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word 
in the province of Asia. And so what ended up happening was Paul wanted to go through Asia Minor, but the Holy Spirit directed them up and around, and he kept bouncing around. You see, our plans might be a straight shot, but God's going to get his plan in and through us. In fact, it took three years of Paul kind of jumping around in these different areas. Before, if you fast forward to Acts, uh, excuse me, if you fast forward into Acts 19, it's Acts 18, 19 and 21, it said that they arrived at Ephesus. Eventually, he got there. Eventually, he made it. But it was on God's timing. Three years it took him to get into this space. I love Proverbs 19.21 tells us that we humans keep brainstorming options and plans, but ultimately God's purposes will prevail. And Paul learned that. For three years it took him before he finally arrived in Ephesus. And then listen to what happens. So they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila, and he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. That was his place of living out the mission, the missile, the vision. He said when they, uh, then they asked him to spend more time with them. They loved what Paul was talking about, and they begged him, hey, would you spend more time with me? Paul was finally living into the mission he thought God was calling him to, but look at what Paul says. It says, verse 20, he declined, but as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. I love that line. I will come back if it is God's will. He's holding his plans, his hopes, but he's holding them loosely with that promise, if it is God's will. How about tacking that little phrase on to so many of our life's decisions? If it is God's will. How would that change and reshape your heart? See, I think it took Paul's three years of bouncing around, struggling, and finally arriving at the one place he wanted to be for him to then be able to hold it loosely. I will be back if it is your will. What if you prayed that prayer, if it is your will, over your marriage, over your family, over your child? If you're hungry, looking for a job, Lord, I I want this job, but Lord, if it is your will. It would radically change because suddenly we would hold these plans loosely. We'd be able to hold them open-handedly. God, if it is your will. Lord, may your will be done. I think one of the most powerful prayers and the reason Jesus Christ prayed it on the night that he was going to the cross was when Christ cried out, Father, Father, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Lord, here's what I want, but ultimately, God, let your will be done. For you, where, where do you need to pray that prayer? Lord, this is what I want. Yet let your will be done. How can you hold that loosely without squeezing it too tight? Uh, Think of that image of Lenny and of mice and men, where he had a dream of having a farm where he could have rabbits, but any time he got a hold of a rabbit, he would squeeze it too tight and kill it. Think of that scene in the diner scene in Tommy Boy, when he's got that sail and then he just squeezes it to death. We can squeeze and suffocate these dreams, but if we hold them loosely, we can surrender them to God. love this quote I came across by Khalil Jameson because he realized relationships are a lot like this. He said, relationships of all kinds are like sand held in your hand. Held loosely with an open hand, the sand remains where it is. But the minute you close your hand and squeeze tightly to hold on, the sand trickles through your fingers. You may hold on to it, but most of it will be spilled. So friends, my invitation is how and where can you hold these promises of God loosely, of what God wants to do in and through you? And ultimately pray, God, if it is your will, a prayer of surrender, 
prayer of letting go so God can use you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today we get the privilege, the opportunity, if you've been with Waypoint, we do these times of praise and prayer to just share what God is up to, what he's doing in our lives and where we need God in our life. And today I've invited in James Broadway, some of y'all might know him through F3 as Les Mis, but, but James, a man who's on mission, a man who's eager to how God might use him and equip him and send him. He's been doing ministry for 17 years, and he's, his wife and his three boys are here, and he just wants to share what God has in store for him. So, James, if you want to come on up. Thanks for uh, having me, and uh, it's good to be with you guys. Um, and uh, so, first, I just want to read this verse. Um, it's from Matthew 9, and it's Jesus speaking to his disciples. He said, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so when there's crowds that are harassed and helpless, Jesus' Jesus's solution is not systems and structures. So what does, he, what does he do? He says, pray and pray to the Lord of the harvest to raise up the laborers to go out into the harvest. So we equate a laborer as a leader, a spiritual leader who's going to go out and care for people, disciple people, and, uh, and then specifically someone who's going to multiply their life or aim to multiply their life. So what Jesus did with his disciples was teach them exactly that, how to reproduce their lives through multiplication. Uh, I just want to point a couple pictures of that with our ministry. So think of where you were at in 1992 and think about what you look like. Okay? All right, ready? So you probably think you didn't look like that, but you did. Um, so I, when this picture came up, I was like, there's no way that's 1992. That's like 1907. No, that's 1992. And so this is all the staff in the world with Campus Outreach in 1992. And um, this team represents a couple international staff and then staff in Georgia and Alabama at the time. And, uh, and just to show you the power of multiplication and the power of spiritual leadership in raising up leaders, here is all the staff in the world in 2013. Uh, what you can't see very well is there's a lot of nations represented there. So there's staff there from Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, um, and that's 2013. So even one of the notable things with Campus Outreach is because our methodology is discipleship and multiplication, we hire almost exclusively from within students we reach with the gospel and then disciple. So we don't put resume, we don't put out there, you know, ads for hire and take resumes. We have a four or five year discipleship process with students and we get to know them and then hire them to our staff team. So what's notable is that more than 40% of the staff in that picture came to faith during their university years and most through campus outreach. So it's an evangelistic ministry, discipling people, and just the idea of growth through multiplication. Um, so you have, with, with multiplication and life-on-life -life discipleship, you get, uh, it starts slow, but then it gets big quick because it multiplies. But then you also get quality. So here's a picture. We're in South Africa. We've been in South Africa for six years now. This is a picture of several of our alumni in South Africa. And uh, one of the uh, horrible things in South Africa with the legacy of apartheid and colonization and things that really trouble the family is that there's 70% of families don't have dads in the home. Um, and this is a, we just, we just didn't get our picture of alumni who happened to still be married. It's literally, I cannot think of a single alumni um, from Campus Outreach who is not still married. Um, and so you go from 70% to, I'm sure there might be one or two, but basically 70% to the upper 90% of families that are still living together and still married and raising their kids. And uh, just so there's, a, there's a, qu a quantitative impact, but there's also a qualitative impact through uh, multiplication. Um, since 2003, so our ministry has been in South Africa since 2003. Since 2003, God has used our ministry to send more than 80 people in South Africa into full-time ministry. So the idea that we really are a leadership pipeline for the church and for missions wherever we're at. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so we, we, uh, we've been there since 2015, and we're starting a new campus outreach in Cape Town, South Africa, with a, uh, a church plant. It's, I guess it's not really a plant anymore. It's about the same age you guys are. So it's, it's uh, eight years old, and uh, we'll be moving back to South Africa in January to start that, working with university students there. Um, so I, I guess I forgot to say, we work with university students, so that's what we, we do. And um, so uh, a few things that um, Wes asks me about, you know, where have you seen God work? So I, I think pictures like this, high quality people, but just a lot of people whose lives transformed by the gospel. Um, so that's been significant over the years and over our time in South Africa as well. Um, how has the Holy Spirit, uh, how, how has the Holy Spirit been using your life and the lives of other people? You know, one of the things with South Africa is it's, um, there's still a legacy of what's left of apartheid and, and racism and uh, the, the troubles there. And uh, God's really used our family to help kind of be a, a gap to bridge people together and to really be a healing presence in the lives of people that we've been ministering to. So we obviously have a heart for university students and for evangelism and discipleship. But one of the notable things over the years that we were there is uh, the way that we were able to help people, particularly black South Africans who feel very marginalized in their own country, uh, have a voice and be able to voice frustrations and to be heard and understood and then to help promote black South Africans into leadership positions within our ministry. Um, so that's, uh, that's some ways that God's been using us. And I think just even to reinforce what Wes is saying here, our goal, so all the staff you saw, you know, in the world in 2013 there, that's great, but that's not our goal. Our goal is lifetime laborers. And it's not for the campus. Our, our motto is for the lost world. So. You know, I love working with the university students. We love working with the university students. But what I really love is to see someone who's 40 and 50 years old walking with Jesus, having walked with Jesus the whole time, and to see that kind of trajectory change in their life. And so, you know, people out in the workforce and in their families living for Jesus, trying to make a difference and then reach other people. So that's what we really get excited about long term. So um, if you have any questions about our ministry or us, just we're approachable. Just find us after the service and, service and you can ask us a question. So really appreciate being with you guys today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, James. When James and I were having coffee and having opportunity to just hear his story, uh, one of the things I found compelling, too, is he had shared that, um, how long ago was it you were looking around here at campus ministry? 2004. So... Wow, that's 17 years now. Yeah. Wow. 17 years ago, he was on Queens' campus kind of looking at maybe doing campus outreach here and spent a year on this campus. And so I love, again, sort of this vision where God's now sent his family to South Africa and that. And now Waypoint has come onto this campus and how we might have an opportunity to reach into the students' lives in and around this uh, space as well. That's the goal of Waypoint. And so I would encourage you, would love for you to get with James and just to be in prayer over his family as they prepare to head to South Africa and head back to continue the good work of what they've been doing. And pray as well for you that what does it stir in you of how you might take a step out in faith as James and his family have. And so what I do just want to spend a moment just using this time of praise and prayer. I just feel the need to ask you all these questions. Because where, where do you need God to work? Especially that one this week. Do any of y'all have a need of where God, where you want God to show up or maybe a place where you've seen God show up in the last week? So I would just invite people where they are if they want to just stand up and please speak loudly to just share what God's doing.